All right. Thank you, Chad. Hi, everyone. It's nice to be here again. I wanted to tell you that I really have found this topic fascinating. So if you find that you have questions as we go through this, feel free. I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Feel free to email me any of those kind of things. I just going deeper and deeper into this is more and more interesting to me. So if you have a question that I've never thought of, that's kind of cool because then it's something more to look into. So this is class number two. I've called it the bias of personal context. Basically in the last class, we looked at how translation is complicated. So that was the idea there. That translation, it's not, it's not like math. There isn't just a, this word equals this word, this word equals this word, so that you can create this one translation and that's the end. There's a lot of different possibilities when you're translating. So that then led to the determination that it's good to look at a lot of different versions and see what they say. Well, tonight we're gonna to be talking about bias. So translator bias, and this is a bias that you maybe haven't thought about before. This is personal bias. So I'm not talking about religious bias, anything along those lines. What I mean is everybody in the world, we all have our paradigm through which we view life, right? And that paradigm is made up of our experiences. It's made up of the time period in which we live, the country that we live in. All of those things contribute to creating bias in a translation. So this is a slide from last time. And I said, how do you decide how to translate a passage? And these are the different things that are part of that decision process. And I want to underline this one here, the context. The context is the number one big important way that you determine how to translate something. These other pieces are what I hope to look at in future classes. So, you know, we'll see. We'll see how many classes you want to have on this. Because <laughs> obviously here on the screen, there's a lot. So we'll, we'll talk about that, come up with a good plan. Okay. What we're going to look at is translators' personal contexts. Okay, here we go. The plan is to look at passages that have been translated historically inaccurately, but preserve the sense. I'll talk about what that means. Passages that have been translated historically inaccurately and don't preserve the sense of the text. And then finally, passages that have been translated historically accurately but they're not contemporary. They don't, they don't make any sense to us today. So the main message here is that translation is biased. Unfortunately, that's how it works. And because we're humans, there's no way to get around that. Translation is going to be biased in different ways. And so the reason that it's so important to have a class like this is because this makes us aware of what that bias can look like. Here's a question to think about. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before. I have four daughters, so I think about unicorns. So the question is, why are there unicorns in the Bible? It's interesting. They don't just show up in one place. They're actually in a number of passages. So why are they there? What's, what's going on with these unicorns? Why did they end up in the translation? So let's talk a little bit about translators' contexts. These are three different translating committees. Now, you can probably figure out which one was the King James. That's the one on the bottom. Now, the two that are on the top, those are a little more difficult. I'll tell you, uh, one is the NIV and one is the ESV. Anybody want to take a, a guess at which is which? There's, there's one. I'll give you a hint. The New International Version is called the New International Version because its team of scholars was much more diverse than other translations it had before. Right, top left. Yeah. So yeah, it's the top left there. Yep. So the NIV actually has a couple of scholars from India on it. And it also is unique in that it had women on the committee, which um, as you can see from the other pictures, these other ones don't. So the one on the top right is the ESV. It's kind of interesting. There's actually uh, a, a translator who's in both pictures huh, on, the, on the two top ones. 
uh, because he ended up, he was in the ESV committee and then uh, also ended up on the newer NIV committee. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about translators' personal context and the interaction that, that, that the translators' experiences and their time period, the interaction between that and the experiences, time period, the context of the audience. Because that's really what reading is, right? When you read, you're having this blending of the author, or in our case, the translator, the translator's context blending with our context today. And that's how we create meaning. So we're going to think about that blending and what it looks like. Here's those three different categories I was talking about. Number one, the translation is, is historically inaccurate, but it carries the sense. Let's talk about what that means. So what that means is that the translation doesn't actually match what the Hebrew says, but it carries the sense of the Hebrew. So if you were to look at it, the Hebrew words would not directly match the English words, but the English conveys the idea. We typically would think of like the NIV or something along those lines like this, that it seeks to preserve the meaning. Last time we talked about formal equivalence versus functional equivalence. So formal equivalence would be like the literal kind of translation. And the functional equivalence would be this, historically inaccurate, but carries the sense. Here's another possibility. Translation is historically inaccurate and doesn't carry the sense. Now, by the way, I, when I said the NIV was like number one, I don't mean all the time, just to make that clear, but that it would lean more in that direction when the translators weren't sure what to do. So number two, this is kind of what you really don't want, right? You don't want a translation that doesn't match the Hebrew and doesn't match what the Hebrew was trying to say, because then you're just left with a translation that doesn't convey any of the purpose of what the Bible says. Number three is the translation is historically accurate, but it only fits the contemporary audience. What I mean by that is you could have a translation that was legitimate and good, but in some cases, people don't understand it. It only worked with a certain audience. And so sometimes the King James falls into this category. And that's what we'll talk about now, that it's historically accurate. It's very literal, but it made sense more to the audience in the 1600s, 1700s when it was revised. Okay. We're going to look at two specific ways that this works, this idea of historically accurate, but fitting the contemporary audience. And we're going to consider words that have died out or new ones that have been invented. So sometimes this is an issue because there's a word and you look at it and you think, wow, I have no idea what that word means. So the word has just died out. This is a trickier one. This is when a word has changed its meaning. So you read it and you think, oh yeah, I know that word. I understand what this passage means. And it turns out that in fact, because of the gap between the time when the translation was translated and today, you actually are misunderstanding the passage because that word in English doesn't mean what it meant back then anymore. So I'll give you some examples of that. Okay, let's see what this looks like. The translation is historically inaccurate, but carries the sense. Now, this is a quote from the Living Bible which we talked about last time, it's a paraphrase. We would typically expect, I shouldn't say expect, but you know, it might not surprise you to see the Living Bible here as our first quotation, right? That, yeah, it's gonna be historically inaccurate, but it might carry the sense. So this is Psalm 1828. See if you can find what is historically inaccurate here. Ready? You have turned on my light. The Lord my God has made my darkness turn to light. All right, anyone? What's historically inaccurate there? Turn on. Turned turn on. on my light, right? You can't turn on lights in the time of David. David wrote this psalm. He was not thinking about turning on lights. Okay, so we know that that is clear. So that is historically accurate, and yet it carries the sense. Here's the Hebrew. It's ta'ir neri, and it means you will light my lamp, right? That's how I would translate this. You will light my lamp. So you get the idea. God turns on my light. That's like our modern day equivalent of you will light my lamp. Okay. Now, as I said, we would probably look at this and say, okay, yeah, living Bible, it does that kind of thing. 
what you might be surprised to know is that formally equivalent translations also do this. And that's why it's helpful to recognize that formal equivalence and functional equivalence are not necessarily categories where this Bible fits into that category, this Bible fits into that. It's really like a spectrum. Let me give you an example. Here's the King James. See if you can find the historical inaccuracy in the King James's translation for this verse. For thou wilt light my candle, the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. What's historically inaccurate about that? Candle. They didn't have candles, right? And yet for so long, I read this and I didn't even think about that at all. Not that, you know, it's not going to make a difference in your salvation, right? Whether or not you're picturing David holding a candle, but it's helpful to recognize, oh, huh. A literal translation did the same thing. So we get this in all kinds of different translations. The translation will be historically inaccurate, but will carry the sense. Ancient Israelites didn't have candles, at least not like ones today. This was their candle, right? This is a lamp that you would have put oil in and you would have had like a, a reed that came out and you would have lit that. Okay, now here's, here's a few for you. And again, we would expect this. This is from the message. This is Joshua 1, verses 1 and 2. It says, after the death of Moses, the servant of God, jo God spoke to Joshua, Moses' assistant. Moses, my servant, is dead. Get going. There's your contemporary idiom, right? Get going doesn't make sense unless you understand it as an idiom. Because you can't get a going. A going is not a thing you can go get. Okay. In addition to that, the message has... God telling Joshua, I'm giving you every square inch of the land you set your foot on. Problem is, again, inches did not exist in terms of the way that people thought. So that brings out an aspect of translator bias that sometimes is intentional, sometimes it's not. Some translations might want to have that kind of thing, like the message was intended to create a contemporary reading. How about this one? 1 Samuel 10, 24, Samuel said to all the people, see him whom the Lord hath chosen, this is King James, there is none like him among all the people. All the people shouted and said, God save the king. Anyone notice the historical inaccuracy there? This is a tougher one. Is it God save the king? It's God save the king, yes. So that makes sense, right? They are translating for King James. It is a British translation. So you're going to get that British phrase, God save the king. It's used in a number of these passages and it is not what the Hebrew says. There's your Hebrew, Yahi Hamelech, which means may the king live. Now that's similar, right? As I said, this is historically inaccurate, but it preserves the meaning. May the king live, God save the king. Same kind of idea, but the Hebrew says absolutely nothing about God. It says absolutely nothing about saving. So the reason I bring this up is because I think we sometimes get this idea that, oh, well, you know, I've been reading this translation all my life. I know where it matches the Hebrew and where it doesn't. Well, maybe not. So that's just something to keep in mind and why I think it's good for us to look at different translations. Because when we look at different translations, that's when we recognize, oh, that one doesn't say God save the king. That says something very different. And that's when we start to ask, why does it say that? And that's how we start to understand a little better. Here's another one. And I'm not trying to pick on the King James. As I said, I, I love the King James. Uh, but this, this was one that, that came up that I saw where I thought, oh, I should mention this one. Okay, this is a historically inaccurate one. When he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Historical inaccuracy there? Easter. Easter, yes. Easter was not a thing at that time. It did not exist. This is your Greek word, Pascha, or Pascha, which is Passover. It's from the Hebrew word for Pesach. So that really should say Passover. And you'll see that a number of the newer translations do say that. Now, I would just 
suppose, you know, I don't know. Um, King James translators had notes as to why they why they translated the way they did, but those notes have disappeared, they're gone. So I would just assume they probably translated it as Easter just because that was what made sense at the time. You know, Easter, Passover, same thing. So we'll translate it that way. Don't know. Okay, let's talk about this next one. The translation is historically inaccurate and doesn't carry the sense. So number one, with the translation being historically inaccurate, but carrying the sense, that works because as long as we can understand the meaning, that's really the point of reading. So that, that helps us. Where we run into problems is when we're reading a translation that is historically inaccurate and doesn't actually carry the sense of the Hebrew. Okay, let me show you what that looks like. Here's an instance in the King James, Deuteronomy 33, 17, says his glory, this is talking about Israel, is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. With them, he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth, and they are the 10,000 of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. Where did that come from? His horns are like the horns of unicorns. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about this. Okay, so number one, we know this isn't a unicorn because you'll notice there, horns, underlined in blue, is plural, right? Unicorns do not have two horns. Otherwise, they'd be, what, duocorns or something like that? I, I don't know, cows, maybe. <laughs> so, so anyway... This, this can't actually be a unicorn, number one. We know that just from the context. That word underlined in blue, horns, is definitely plural. It's dual in the Hebrew. So Hebrew has a way of marking out words as being not just plural, but having two, and that's called the dual form. So that there, that word horns, is actually two horns. So this is not a unicorn. The word for unicorn is ra'aim, and it is definitely masculine singular. So that's actually a mistranslation up there as well. So it should say his horns are like the horns of a unicorn, if they wanted to use the word unicorn. It should be singular. Now, people think it's probably this cow called an auroch because uh, what we see here is we're talking about a singular thing with two horns, right? According to the verse. So it can't be a unicorn. And this was like a big cow back in those days. So there's a huge horn for you. See somebody holding it. So historians think we're probably talking about an auroch. Okay, so the question then is, well, if that's what we're talking about, if we're talking about a big cow, where did unicorn come from? How did, how did they come up with that? Well, the Septuagint says monokerontos, so one horn is how that would translate to in Greek. So that's what the Septuagint says. The Latin Vulgate says rhinocerotus, like a rhino, right? One horn. And the same word, by the way, in the Vulgate is used in Psalm twenty-two twenty-one. 21, or sorry, in the same, the same word is used in the Hebrew and translated into the Vulgate as unicorn. Well, actually, I guess in Latin, it's unicornium. So that's, that's what you have there. I don't, I don't know Latin. Maybe someday. Isaiah 34, verse 7, same thing. You have unicornus. So probably what happened here is the King James translators got influenced by what was going on in the Septuagint and the Vulgate, and that's where unicorn came from. So if you ever wonder, how do we get unicorn in the Bible? It's probably one of those leftovers from the Vulgate, because that was one of the still major translations at the time when the King James was being translated. So that's that history there. Let me give you another example of that. So we're looking at places where, where a term or phrase is historically inaccurate and doesn't carry the sense. Let me give you another one. Here's the ESV. This is 1 Timothy 3.8. It says, deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. I don't know if you've ever looked at this before, but did you know that the word deacon in Greek happens to be the word deacon. 
this is this is not a translation. It's just a transliteration into English. So so what ended up happening is this word in Greek, deacon, it's diakonos, deacon, was transliterated into English when translators started going, started translating. And so the ESV just preserves that. So you read this in 1 Timothy 3.8, and it sounds like it's talking about something official. A deacon must be dignified, not double-tongued, as if you have to go through a job interview, you have to get hired, all these kind of things to become a deacon. And yet, did you know that deacon actually just means servant? It's used all over the place in the New Testament as somebody who is a servant of the Ecclesia. So this is not talking about an official position in the Ecclesia. This is talking about people who serve. Here's what the King James said. And you can see how this got even like magnified in the King James. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, I will tell you, did you know that the Greek there does not include the word office, does not include the word of, it only says for those who have used or for those who have been deacons, well, purchased to themselves a good degree. So you can see how translated contexts have influenced them to say, oh, right, deacon. That's so you can see, you can see official church Bible. Example. Here's the RSV. Look for the two church positions, okay? So this is now Paul writing to Titus, Titus 1, verses 5 to 7. Look for the two positions. He says here, this is why I left you in Crete, that you might amend what was defective and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If any man is blameless, the husband of one wife and his children are believers, and not open to the charge of being profligate or insubordinate. For a bishop, as God's steward, must be blameless. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. So do you see the two offices in this translation here? Yes. Yeah. So you yeah. have Stewart. elders, right? Yeah. And you have bishops. So it appears from this translation that, again, you have this kind of like hierarchy of offices within the ecclesia, elders and bishops. Well, take a look at this. You might be surprised. This is the New Living Translation. And you will notice that the New Living Translation does not include the word bishop. It just has everyone here as an elder. So you look at this, and this, again, I feel like really emphasizes why it's helpful to read multiple translations. Because when you look at this, you think, hey, wait a minute. I thought that in Titus, it was talking about two different offices. You know, I've always read Titus, and it talks about a bishop and an elder. Here I am reading the New Living Translation, and it only says elders. What is going on? Well, I will tell you this. These are two different words. You have presbuteros and episcopos. Two different words for elder and bishop. So it looks like the RSV was correct in the way that it translated it and not the New Living Translation. But here we go. Here's our two words. Yellow one is, was translated as bishop. Green one was translated as elder. Take a look at this. Acts chapter 20, verse 17 in the RSV, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. This is Paul. That is your word, presbuteros. That's the word elders. Acts 20, 28, Paul goes on. So again, this is from the RSV. And it says, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. This is what he's telling those elders in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with the blood of his own son. You want to guess what that word overseers is? That's your word, bishop, episcopos. In other words, he tells the elders, you are overseers. So an elder and a bishop was the same at that time. The bishops were elders. So what you can see then is, oh, wait a minute. Perhaps then the New Living Translation has legitimacy in translating them all as the same thing. Hmm. Something to, something to think about. 
Okay, and that then gets rid of what would appear to be specific offices. And instead, Paul is using the term elder and overseer interchangeably. Okay, so that's an interesting thing to consider. This is what looking at translations can show us. So what we've seen is that we can have historically inaccurate translations that carry the sense, or we can have historically inaccurate translations that don't carry the sense. These are difficult to see. Let me show you what I mean by that. Now, you maybe figured that out already from the examples that we saw, but I want you to take a look at this one. Sometimes it can be really, really hard to see where these historical inaccuracies carry the sense or not. So take a look at this. I will tell you there are two idioms in this verse. Job 19, verse 20. This is from the NIV translation. In the NIV, there are two idioms. But the Hebrew only has one idiom. Do you want to try and, first of all, can you find the two idioms that are in this verse? Skin of my teeth. Yep, skin of my teeth. That's one of them. Skin and bones. I'm nothing but skin and bones. So we have two idioms here. Nothing but skin and bones. I've escaped by the skin of my teeth. Now, the difficulty is, if you were just reading the NIV, you would look at that and you'd say, oh, okay, here we go. Right, I get, I get the idea. But, but you wouldn't know that, in fact, one of these doesn't quite match the Hebrew. So that's what's interesting about it. So let me show you this. There's your Hebrew. And the Hebrew, this is my translation, would read, my bone sticks to my skin and to my flesh. So that's the NIV's English idiom. But if you were just reading the NIV, I think you would probably think, oh, okay, the NIV has created two English idioms here. And you wouldn't actually know, oh, no, actually, the skin of my teeth is actually in the Hebrew. I escaped by the skin of my teeth. That's exactly what the Hebrew says. So it's one of those instances where, in fact, that whole phrase, skin of my teeth, I would venture to say, now, I'm, I'm not like an etymologist, so, you know, I can't, I can't tell you, like, the origin of the etymology of words, but I wouldn't be surprised if Job 19 verse 20 is the reason we have that phrase, the skin of my teeth. And yet again, if we're not looking for these kind of things and reading multiple translations, you know, we wouldn't know that. We would just think, oh, the NIV translators added to it to make it make more sense. Okay. So here's the formal equivalent translations. My bone cleaves to my skin. I escaped with the skin of my teeth. Okay. So all translations, here's the point, no matter how literal, are going to add contemporary ideas because every translation has foibles. You can't make one that's perfect. It would be nice, but it just doesn't work that way. And so that's why I think it's important to read a spectrum of translations. Okay. So let's take a look at this then. The third idea is that the translation is actually historically accurate. So unlike the first and the second, this translation is accurate, but it only really fits with the audience that was around when it was written. So that means that words have died out. And so we read the word and we think, oh, I don't know what that means. Or the word has changed its meaning. And that's the one that's really difficult. So let me give you some examples. Ready for this? Words have died out or new ones have been invented. And as I told you before, you know, I read the King James for decades. And if you had asked me, hey, is this word in the King James? I probably would have told you no. Like I did, that's like how used to it I got. But if you asked me, can you explain what this word means? I would have again told you no, because I, I just didn't realize it was there. And yet I didn't know what it meant. So it's one of those things where you can get used to stuff and you don't stop to think about it. So, you ready for this one? O ye sons of men, Psalm 4, verse 2. How long will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love vanity and seek after leasing? Psalm 5, verse 6. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. Now, maybe some of you out there are aware of what the word leasing means. When I think of leasing, I think of a car. You know, I'm going to go lease that car or something like that. And 
I'm pretty sure that's not what this is talking about. Now, what's interesting is I decided, well, you know what? I'll just look this up. I'll look up this word in the Cambridge Dictionary, right? Cambridge Dictionary, good dictionary. So let's see what it says. Look at its definition. Leasing is a financial arrangement in which a person, company, et cetera, pays to use land, a vehicle, et cetera, for a particular period of time. Apparently, the Cambridge Dictionary also thought of leasing cars, which is huh, not what the verse is saying. So what is actually going on? What is leasing that this verse is talking about? Well, I found it in Merriam-Webster, archaic, the act of lying. So there you go. Now, so that's an instance, I would say in which it's a historically accurate translation. The Hebrew says, God will go against those who lie. And yet it's a translation that we look at it and we're like, whoa, I, I do not know what that word means. Okay, so you'll notice that ESV says, those who seek after lies. ESV says, you destroy those who speak lies. So instead of leasing, in the ESV, we get lies. Here's another instance. This, this was a pretty good word. I mean, some of these words, like, I kind of like them, actually. Part of me wants to, like, use them, you know, bring them, let's bring them back. So here we go. Behold, the noise of the bruit is come, and a great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Judah desolate and a den of dragons. Okay. You better watch out for the noise of the bruit. <laughs> okay, so what, what is that? What is a bruit? Does anybody actually know? What a brew it is? No? Okay. Here's another one. Nahum 319. There's no healing of thy bruise. Thy wound is grievous. All that hear the bruit of thee shall clap the hands over thee. For upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually? Okay. So we have these bruits going on here in Jeremiah 1022 and Nahum 319. Once again, the Cambridge Dictionary fails us because it says that bruit is a verb. And it's clearly not a verb in these verses. Okay, Merriam-Webster, however, gives us a definition of bruit as a noun, in which it says, once again, archaic, and it defines it as noise or din or report or rumor. And that makes sense. And so you'll notice in the ESV, you have the same translation, a voice, a rumor, instead of bruit. Behold, it comes a great commotion. Nahum 3.19 ESV says, all who hear the news about you clap their hands over you. Now, I'm not trying to make fun of the King James or anything along those lines. I, what I'm attempting to do here is just underline a little bit that even though we might be very fluent in King Jamesism, which is good, you know, I think it's good for our minds to be exercised that way. I think it's a good thing. There are still probably words we don't know. So let me give you some more examples. How about this? This is from a man named Edwin Palmer. This is what he said. Just to drive home the point even more clearly, what is the meaning of chambering in Romans 13, 13? Champagne in Deuteronomy eleven thirty. Charger, it's not a horse. Churl, sealed, circumspect, clouded upon their feet, cockatrice, collops, confection, which has nothing to do with sugar. Coats, covert, hoised, wimples, that's one of my favorites, wimples, stomacher, wat, whist, withs, want, shirtership, sackbutt, the skull, scrabbled, roller, muffler, froward, brigadine, immerse, blains, crooked back, desk cry, fanners, fellows, gleed, glistering, habergion, implead, niecing, niter, tabret, and wen. Now, we could probably, some of us could probably explain some of those words, but there's a lot there that if you were to say to me, please tell me, um, what do you make of a brigadine? I'd say, I have no idea what that is. Sorry, I, you know, I don't even, to be totally honest, I don't even know if I pronounced that right. So that's, that's one of those things, you know, there's a, there's a lot of words where we just don't totally know. The other problem is, like, because we don't use them anymore. The other problem is, is that words also change their meanings. This is what we call false friends. So see if you can find it here. 
a word that has changed its meaning. And so therefore we think we know what's going on in the verse, but in fact, we actually don't. So Esther 4.14 says, for if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. Who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Anyone know what word here is a word that we're familiar with but doesn't actually mean the meaning we would give it today. Enlargement. Enlargement. So next question, what did enlargement mean before? Hmm. Martha says to be at large, to be released. released. To be released, yes. It, it conveys the sense of like relaxation, interestingly. So there you go. So that's one of those things where you would read it, and unless you're really thinking about it, you might not notice. You know, and you would you would think that what Mordecai is telling Esther is, oh, the Jews are going to become huge, you know, and not like huge people, but like as a nation, you know, become really big, something like that. But that's not what he's saying. Okay, how about this one? Daniel 3, 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in the matter. Okay, how about that? Not careful, which essentially means the exact opposite of what we would expect it to mean today. Okay, this is my favorite one. 2 Timothy 3, verses 2 and 3. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to the parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, and unfortunately, they will also be incontinent. Okay, so this is one of those instances where we can see that there are words that we still use today, but clearly, Paul was not trying to warn Timothy to watch out for incontinent people. Okay, so we have to, it's difficult and that's why it's nice to be able to consult other translations. Okay, now I wanna, I, I know that there have been a number of things where I have shown the KJV to have made mistakes in um, personal context of the translators, sometimes the unicorn thing and this stuff with the, um, these false friends and whatnot. Okay, so let's, show some of the redeeming qualities of the King James, all right? So that we don't feel like this is a King James attack. Because interestingly, as words in English change and have thus made it in some cases more difficult to understand the King James, the changing of English has also made it so that the King James is in fact more necessary. Let me show you what I mean by that. The way that the word you has changed in English has led to a loss of precision. And this is in a case in which the King James becomes incredibly valuable. So look at this. Numbers 10, 29, ESV. Ready? Moses said to Hobab, the son of Reuel the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, we are setting out for the place of which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us and we will do good to you. For the Lord has promised good to Israel. Now, there's two different ways that you could read this verse. You could read this as though Moses goes to Hobab and he says, Hobab, we're about to leave. We're going to go to the land that God said he would give to us. So come with us and we will do good to you. That's way number one. Way number two, you could read this in the ESV, is Moses goes to Hobab and Moses says, we're going to go to the land that God told you he would give to you, Hobab. So come with us and we'll help you get it. We'll do good to you. Now, contextually, we know that that second doesn't quite make a whole lot of sense because there's not really any place where God promises the land of Hobab. However, the King James actually shows us a little more what's going on. This is the Masoretic text. This is the first to you. Looks like that. And this is actually plural. So the 
the Hebrew is able to distinguish between singular and plural use. So this is really like to y'all. So there you go. Texas preserved our form of you plural, which we should appreciate. Okay. So there's our moment of appreciation for Texas. <laughs> okay. Then we have the second you is lach to you, masculine singular. So if you're looking at it in the Hebrew, it's very clear that the first time Moses says to you, he's talking about a group of people. In other words, the Israelites, not Hobab. God promised to the Israelites that he would give them the land. The second you is singular. That's Hobab. Now, you have this preserved in the King James, and you do not have this preserved in other translations. So this is why I do not think it is a good idea for us to say, oh, the King James is outdated. We're done with it. Don't do that. We should read from a lot of translations, and the King James should be one of those. Here's why. The Lord said, I will give it you. That in King James's time, was plural. We will do the good. The was singular. So what you have is you have the King James preserving the plural and the singular pronouns. You, ye, those are plural. The, thou, those are singular. Have you ever wondered, you know, why, why does it sometimes say you? Why does it sometimes say thee? And that's the reason why because both Greek and Hebrew distinguish between plural and singular pronouns. And so the King James does too. Okay, here's another place where this is interesting. First Corinthians chapter three, the apostle Paul says twice that you are the temple of God. Now I have heard this so many times and you probably have too, apply to us individually. You know, we have to take care of our bodies because we are the temple and all of that kind of thing. Do you know, that the King James actually makes it clear to us that that's not what Paul is saying. And here's why. Because he says, your body in the King James, not thy body. In other words, there's the Greek. It's plural. So when Paul is writing to them, what he's saying is, you all as an ecclesia, are one body. And as that body, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. The King James shows us that. Okay, so let's conclude here. So I want to make it clear that we really should not look at certain translations and say, oh, well, see, that one's outdated, like the King James, or, oh, that one's no good. What we really should be doing is recognize that all translations have strengths and weaknesses. Some have more strengths and some have more weaknesses, but it's useful to look at as many as we can. Now, I don't want anybody to come out of this and say, oh, wow, look at how biased all translations are. This is terrible. You know, do some translations change the gospel? Which Bible is actually the word of God? Well, I want to put this out there. God's gospel is so powerful that I don't think translators can ruin it. So I want to make that clear. I think that's the first thing. Now, just in this regard about the gospel and translations, I want to just show you a few things. Because sometimes we do get on this um, feeling of, well, other translations, new translations really make it difficult to see what the truth is. Sometimes that's true. But other times it's not. And I, I think it's important to be balanced when we're thinking about these things because every translation has its strong points and weak points. So let me show you this. Job 1 verse 6 in the King James. You clearly have Satan there in the King James. ESV, same thing, right? So that's not more difficult than the ESV. Did you know, though, 
both of these are way worse than Young's literal translation. So Young's literal translation, instead of saying Satan, translates it as the adversary. Which, by the way, according to the Hebrew, makes way more sense. The reason being, in Job, it reads there, Ha-Satan. That translates directly to the Satan or the adversary. Now, nobody in Hebrew has the in front of their name. You know, if they're a specific person. So because this is the Satan, you know, this is not somebody's name. This is not Satan also came among them. No, it should be the adversary. So in this case, Young's literal, a relatively newer translation, is more helpful than some of the other ones. Here's another example. Psalm 9, 17, King James, the wicked shall be turned into hell. So the wicked go to hell. Weirdly enough, here's the New Living Translation, which says the wicked will go down to the grave. Look at that. Huh. Here's the NIV. The wicked go down to the realm of the dead. And I show this because I think we sometimes get in our minds that, oh, no, here's this person that we're trying to preach to. And, oh, look, they read from that translation. Now it's going to be really hard to teach them. And, in fact, I think there are instances where the newer translations actually make it clearer. Like the New Living Translation here, the grave, that's a lot easier to understand. Here's another example of just, again, the breadth in translations. John 1.18, King James, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who's in the bosom of the father, he has declared him, only begotten son. RSV says the same thing, the only son who's in the bosom of the father. Here's the NIV. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only son who is himself God. That is very different. And that can make things more difficult. But again, I, I put these up so that we can recognize, you know, we don't, we don't want to just like make general statements of, oh, you know, newer translations make it harder. Uh, that's not necessarily the case. On the last slide, we actually saw that the NIV was clearer than the King James was. In this case, it's not. So it's one of those instances where it's helpful to recognize that, you know, it's hard to make a blanket statement here. Okay. Now, I do want to say, by the way, that this is, this is a weird verse because scholars aren't actually sure how it is supposed to read. And so all of these express truth in the sense that there are multiple verses that refer to Jesus as God. And I think that's an important thing to recognize, right? So either, either way that this actually goes, I'm not trying to preach the deity of Jesus or anything like that. You all are aware of that. <laughs> but, but my point is, is that any of these actually work because there are numerous passages that do refer to Jesus as God. So we, we have to recognize that one passage is not going to ruin the truth. You know, one, one passage that's translated poorly, or even a handful of passages that are translated poorly. God's truth is more powerful than that. Now look at this one. Ready for this? This is an instance where the message really pulls through. So this is John 10, verse 30 from the message. It says, I and the Father are one heart and mind. Versus King James, I and my Father are one. ESV, I and the Father are one. So in the message, you actually get the perspective that shows us the way they are one heart and mind, or the way they are one. And it's because they're one heart and mind. Okay, this is one that I think is fascinating. This is Philippians chapter 2, 6 to 7. You maybe have noticed this before. In the King James, it says that Jesus thought it not robbery to be equal with God. In other words, he recognized it was okay to be equal with God. Here's the ESV. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. It's the opposite. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God versus he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. This is a case where the ESV shows Jesus clearly subordinate to God. Whereas in the King James, you get him equal with God. 
Now, I wanted to show you this just because I thought it was interesting to see that this is what some evangelicals say. The ESV in Philippians 2, 6 to 7, drops an atomic bomb on the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the clearest verses in the Bible proclaiming that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, and the ESV totally changes the verse to deliberately deny the deity of Jesus Christ. The ESV changes the clear definitive statement, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, to the exact opposite, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Here's something fascinating. This is one small instance. But as I was researching for this class, what I found is that there are numerous evangelicals who are very angry about newer translations. And the reason they're very angry about it is because they say newer translations make it harder to understand the fact that Jesus, the fact that Jesus is the second person in the Trinity. They make it harder to understand the doctrine of hell. They make it harder to understand the immortality of the soul. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> this, you know, what? These people are saying the, these make the gospel more difficult to understand. So it was one of those instances of realizing, oh, wow, wait a minute. Like, I guess this is why it's helpful to read all the translations and be able to see the way that they, the way that they translate all the various passages. So they all preserve the gospel if they're read in their entirety. The entire Bible teaches the gospel. There is no way that translators could mess up the whole Bible. Okay. That's an important thing to understand. Translation is not going to inhibit God's salvation. There are maybe a few verses that we're going to understand differently, but it's not going to ruin things. I want to just read this to you from the preface of the King James as we close. This is what the King James translators said about that idea that translation could ruin the gospel. They said, now to the latter we answer that we do not deny Nay, we affirm and avow that the very meanest translation, so that, that's the worst translation of the Bible, they say, in English, set forth by men of our profession, for we have seen none of theirs of the whole Bible as yet, containeth the word of God. Nay, is the word of God. So they say the worst translation that you could get in English is the word of God. As the king's speech, which he uttereth in parliament, being translated into French, Dutch, Italian, and Latin, is still the king's speech, though it be not interpreted by every translator with the like grace, nor peradventure so fitly for praise, nor so expressly for sense everywhere. So their example here is that even though the king's words get translated differently, and some translators do it well, other ones don't, it's still the king's words. And so the point here is that translation is not going to obscure the gospel. But we do well to recognize that translation is inherently, because we are humans, biased, but it can't hide God's good news. So to summarize, which Bible should you use? Here's what I think we should do. Number one, know which translations are formal and which ones are functional. Understand the translation philosophy, and then use both of them, knowing what you're using. I would study from a formally equivalent translation, one that's more literal. Study from that. Do the readings from one that's functionally equivalent. I like to read from a different translation every year. So this year, last year was the ESV. This year I'm doing the NIV. When they are different, look at a lot of different translations and see a lot of times you're going to find footnotes that explain why they're different. Remember, which are formal and which are functional, because sometimes that's just going to explain the difference. Look for idioms and figurative language, or ask somebody who knows the original languages. Or, if you really want, you could learn the language yourself. So, ready for this? Here's our final slide. I said, you can ask someone if you want. That's my email address. If you would like to email me, people, I, I get probably, I get like a couple emails every day with Hebrew and Greek questions. And I'm totally happy to answer more. Um, I think I think it's fun. So this is like a fun part of my day when I get these emails and think, ooh, this is interesting. So feel free to email me if you're looking at something and you want to know, hey, I was reading out of the King James and I saw that the RSV translates it like this. Why is it different? I'd love to look at that together. I think that sounds fun. And 
if you're interested as well, if you want to learn the language, we're always doing Hebrew and Greek courses, and we would love to have you. All right. Thanks, everyone. And Lord willing, I'll see you next month. What we'll talk about then is why religious bias gets into translation and how we can spot that.